The left side, that was in today's paper. It said, that's what a tactical nuclear bomb looks like when it's detonated. And they reminded us in the newspaper that there are thousands and thousands and thousands of these tactical nuclear weapons all over Europe that are facing off between the, the east and the west, okay? So look what I wrote. In today's world, more people are thinking about nuclear war than any time in history. Okay, that's, that's what's going on. Yep. This was last night on Russian national TV. You can see the, there's the Russian, uh, and uh, here is the, the repeating station here in Europe. That was Russia threatening Europe over the Ukrainian war. Now look what was the headline this morning. These are the headlines this morning. Uh, because it's a British paper. What would happen if one of those tactical nukes, uh, well, actually a little bigger than a tactical, a 500 kiloton, that's a ha half a megaton, um, if it hit right in the heart of financial London, right there, the bullseye, look, look what they're looking at. A fireball in the center that melts everything, 100% loss of life in the red part, uh, everybody fried, so 100% so loss of life in the bullseye here. The wider thing, uh, you're going to be completely irradiated and will die soon after. Uh, the blue, uh, all buildings collapse. <laughs> Look at that. How would you like that? I mean, they're, they're showing, you know, what's 10 Downing Street and Buckingham and Tower Bridge will all be gone and 800,000 people. Do you know what this is doing? Bonnie and I have passed out more gospel tracts in the last three days than we have in weeks. Why? Because, I mean, it's very interesting. Uh, when we meet people, when we're out, you know, we have to, you know, buy, uh, you know, laundry soap and buy bread. You know, we're staying in a speaker's apartment. And, and when we're out and people say, what are you doing here? You're Americans. And I say, oh, I teach the Bible. I teach the Bible. I actually show it to him. I say, I teach the Bible. You know what one man just said? Last night, I spent 18 years of my life uh, in, in religious schools, orthodox schools, uh, but I don't know much about it now. And that immediately led into us sharing the gospel and giving him a Bible study, a gospel track. He's speaking to me in English, and so he can work it out. So just for you to think about, okay, so there's London. Ah. Paris, I mean, another ally. Uh, the Louvre would go, the Eiffel Tower would go, the Elysee Palace, I mean, the same bullseye and all the way out from, you know, I mean, if you live inside that bullseye, you probably wouldn't live long. Well, they didn't think it's enough to talk about Europe. They say, well, America's in this too. So here, in this morning's paper, that everybody's thinking about and reading and talking about what if one of these hits Washington, D.C., and it's going to go from Maryland to Virginia? Do you see that? Amazing. And that bullseye is complete gone and lingering death. Wow. And then, of course, they put in New York City, and they said the effect, see at the bottom here, the effect of a nuclear uh, blast centered on New York's financial district is illustrated, wipes out the whole southern tip of Manhattan, and causes damage and burns spanning much of Brooklyn and Jersey. That's what people are thinking about. More people are thinking about their, their world ending. Everything that they've fought for, the, the whole climate would be ruined for thousands of years with a nuclear exchange is what they're talking about. Well, so, so what are we teaching our students? I mean, the students are thinking about this too. Young people are thinking, do I have a future? Do I have a hope? And we say, that's why we're studying Paul's letters and his life. I mean, Paul was living in a very desperate time. Uh, persecution and death and, and destruction were all around him. His people were being, uh, you know, under occupation with the Roman Empire and soldiers everywhere, and he was being beaten and he had chains and he was imprisoned. What was the, the lesson that Paul taught 
starting with the very first letter to local churches. What was the content? Prophecy and sanctification. Eschatology and soteriology. Those were Paul's very, very important core curriculum. So what did he teach? Well, if I summarized everything that the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Peter, the Gospel writers, what they, under inspiration, drew from the Old Testament, plus all the new revelation God gave, it's right here in front of you, okay? I'll just give you my three-minute summary that Paul taught, and John taught, and Peter taught, and Matthew, and Mark, and Luke, okay, and Jude, okay? This is what the New Testament writers taught. They were telling everybody, you should start thinking about life from today to eternity. Don't just think about today. Look beyond today toward eternity. That's how you get an orientation for living your life. You know, in navigation, you have to have two fixed points, the horizon and a fixed point of a star. So if you can get the horizon and a star, you know exactly where you are. You can navigate. That's called celestial navigation, okay? The fixed point is the Word of God and God's plan for eternity. And as soon as we see ourself today in the Word of God and where we're going to be in eternity, we can navigate life with hope and joy and peace. And that is what transformed the Roman Empire. That's how Christianity won. That's how so many people got saved. That's what we see in the book of Acts going on. Paul turned their world, they, the unsaved people, said he turned it upside down. But what he really did is he turned it right side up. And all of a sudden, people had an orientation to why they were here, where they came from, and where they were headed. And it just changed their lives. Okay? So we're right here. Paul was, and all the apostles were a part of the local church and Jesus Christ establishing his church and building his church. The very first prophetic event is the rapture. Now, don't take this wrong, but I always tell people there are two raptures Jesus describes. Number one, he describes the personal rapture. That's when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death and Jesus Christ comes to take us home. We call it dying. That's not very nice nowadays. We, you know, brother so-and-so died. You know what the early church said? They actually celebrated that they went home, that, that Jesus came. Uh, he says, I will never leave you or forsake you. And though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'm going to go with you. And it's appointed unto man once to die. I have an appointment with you. And I'm going to come and get you. I'm going to take you home. John 14, to the place I prepared for you. That's why when, when uh, Bonnie and I, while I was pastoring local churches, I had the opportunity for many years to go back and forth and be a part of of Slavic Gospel Association's work in Volgodonsk in Russia, working with planting churches. One thing that fascinated me was how much the local church pastors over in Russia loved funerals. When one of the people in the congregation of, died of old age or cancer or something, they started at the church and had a big singing time that talking about singing about that they had gone to heaven. And then they would take the casket and they would walk up and down almost every street of the village with the casket singing songs on their way to the cemetery. And by the time they got there, they had gathered many people from the village or town because they wondered what is going on. They're carrying this casket around. And the pastor at the graveside would preach. Jesus said, I'm the resurrection life, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. And Jesus came and took them home, and their body is in this box, but they're in heaven. That's the personal rapture where Jesus comes and takes you home. To be absent from the body is present with the Lord. See, it's, that's what the scriptures say. The group rapture is right here. Whoop, back up. Sorry, I get all excited. Uh, the resurrection of the church, the rapture, that's 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Thessalonians 4. Paul, huge on eschatology. So there we go to heaven. So the next event is right here. The world ruler makes a seven-year treaty with Israel. 
that's what we're going to talk about today. Paul connects the dots. That world ruler we're going to talk about right here in 2 Thessalonians 2. In fact, that's where I was when I was reading. I'm reading with you. This is my journal. I'm doing the same study as you, only I'm quite a few weeks ahead of all of you, I hope. Uh, this is what I wrote from 2 Thessalonians 2. Truth lovers are saved. Things got so bad for believers in Thessalonica, a rumor spread that they had missed the rapture. Paul explains even more of God's future plans to them. See, Paul was always connecting the prophetic dots. Did you know nowadays people think that, that prophecy is extraneous, it's controversial, it's ancillary, it's not important, it's not a core doctrine, we should be teaching you know, church polity or something. No, that's not what Paul thought. Paul said eschatology was vital, it was crucial, it was the core curriculum. Th there were two things. It, the whole idea of soteriology, how you get saved and sanctified, and eschatology, why God saved you and why he's sanctifying you, because he has a purpose for you here, and he's taking you home and preparing a place, and you're going to stand in front of him and give an account. That's a summary of all of Paul's epistles. So look what he says to the Thessalonians. Believers, in verses, I'm in 2 Thessalonians 2. That was my study this morning. 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 believe, and 2. Believers await being gathered to Christ. That's our hope. That's in 1 Thessalonians 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, and right here in 2 Thessalonians 2. Second lesson. Remember, we're looking for principles and truths and lessons. The second one I found is Paul taught prophecy. The Antichrist sits in the Jerusalem temple yet to come, and mirrors Antiochus IV's abomination. That's in verses 3 to 5. Uh, and I could go through the whole thing, but let me just read to you uh, what it says in 2 Thessalonians, because that is all about this world ruler right here on the chart from today to eternity. Getting our orientation on today and looking toward eternity, that's, remember that's how we navigate in life. Verse 3. Let no one deceive you by any means that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Now remember the Antichrist has over 20 titles in the Bible. There are two of them. Uh, the man of sin and the son of perdition. Verse 4, who poses and exalts himself above all that is called God or is worshipped so that he sits as God in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. In the temple of God? What's the temple of God? We're the temple of God. That's true. What temple is he talking about? These people lived around towering 60-foot high column temples of all the pantheon of the Greco-Roman world. They would have said, what temple are you talking about? Are you talking about the temple? No. Paul said, no, no. He said, in Jerusalem, the temple Daniel saw, the temple Jesus saw, and the temple that John 30 years after Paul, is writing about, he saw it too. Paul said, God told me there's going to be a temple built in Jerusalem, a rebuilt temple for a regathered nation of Israel for a, a climactic ending to human history. Now look at verse 5. This is what I was trying to get to. Don't you remember I was still with you? I told you about all this. How long, by the way, was Paul with the Thessalonians? As far as we know, for sure, three weeks. And he covered what you see in this chart? You bet. Sanctification and prophecy. Soteriology, eschatology. That's what Paul had at the core of his teaching the church. It's not normal today. Maybe that's why the church is kind of floundering. People think it's more important, their education, their 401, 403B, you know, pedigree. Uh, they're all concerned about their genealogy and DNA and a fixation on our health and everything else. If you're all fixated on that, how would you risk your life to share the gospel with a hostile crowd? Why well, you'd say, well, genetically, I'm not predisposed to healing very quick, so I better not. You know, Stan, what I mean, we would find a million reasons, and we are finding a million reasons to not do what we were left to do. Okay, Let, let's get down to the brass tacks. 
How do you apply all this? Well, that's why we have our journal. This is my journal. I tote with me everywhere in the world. By the way, these charts that, that I show you here, I've printed them off just like, like, you know, I've posted them for you on Facebook and on our website. I print them off. I keep them here, right here in the front of my, because I'm doing this study with you. I have my MacArthur Study Bible uh, with me right here on my phone, and I'm just going through all this with you. But the purpose of carrying all this gear, my Bible and my notebook, is for the application. This is what I wrote. Lord, I want to wait in hope of you gathering me into your arms to dwell in the place you prepared for me. Now see, that's what prophecy does. It gets us from looking down to looking up and then seeing people with that orientation as the reason we're here, that God created us to do something no one else can do, to reach someone no one else can reach, to live a life that someone's going to watch that no one else could do for his glory. It's fulfilling God's purpose in our generation. So if I said, Lord, I want to do that. Teach me more of your plans. I want to know and follow your truth. Restrain Satan's influence on my life. Sanctify every part of my life. I love your truth. I want to be holy. Establish comfort and fill me with hope. For Jesus' sake, amen. Now that's, that's the application of this entire second chapter of 2 Thessalonians. Okay, back here to our chart. So let me just finish this chart really quickly because my whole goal is, and I think I've already done it, we could finish right now, is to show you Paul connects the dots. First, Paul tells us the very next event for us is either our personal rapture when we die and are gathered into the arms of the Lord and taken home, or the group rapture of the church leaving the world. After that happens, uh, the restraint of the Holy Spirit is, is kind of in abeyance so that the Antichrist rises. Uh, he starts deceiving Israel. Then he breaks his treaty with Israel. Look at this, Daniel 9. Revelation 7, um, Israel begins to seek God because Jerusalem is attacked. Jesus returns to rescue them. This is the second coming right there. Not to be confused with the rapture right here. And then the end of human history is right here, the sheep and goat judgment. Then God takes over and completely is running uh, world events uh, directly from Jerusalem. That's called the kingdom age, the millennial age. Uh, and the resurrection of Old Testament and tribulation believers is in Revelation 20, verse 4. Uh, and we live and reign with Christ for a thousand years. And then there's the big rebellion. And, and I have a whole course on this, the whole Revelation course that you can look for on YouTube. It's 20 uh, lessons long. And then the first universe is burned up. Peter tells us uh, Satan is judged and, and uh, great white throne judgment. God completely recreates. He uncreates and recreates the universe. And there's a new heaven and new earth. And what we tell people is, you can be here in a perfect place by calling on the name of the Lord. Last week, I told you God only sees four world empires. Do you remember that? And here they are, the Babylonian, Medo-Persian, Greek, and Roman one, and Roman two. This is called this one in the image is the revived Roman Empire uh, that we've talked about. And what I explained to you is the context, the reason why we need to do all this history and geography and culture stuff is it's the context God picked for the Bible. But we understand in order to apply it by this. Number one, Christ, everything in his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection was in the Roman Empire. Paul's entire life and ministry were across the Roman Empire. All 13 of his epistles were written and circulated in the Roman Empire. Paul even says in Galatians, his very first epistle, that the Roman Empire is the fullness of the time. That's why I, I call this course the fullness of the time. And that's why now the connecting the dots in this fifth lesson is all about how 
Paul uses all the pictures. One of the places we went here in Athens is the largest temple in Greece built by Antiochus IV. In fact, this morning, I ended our, our class time by, by taking the class up to the Philippapu Monument, which has an, in, an engraving, uh, an image of Antiochus IV, who was the one that built that largest temple, who was the one that desecrated the temple in Jerusalem, who is the one Jesus said is the earthly picture of what the Antichrist is going to look like. Do you see how relevant the Roman Empire is? Jesus considered it to be the illustration and the, the backdrop for his plan for the end of the world. The best way to understand, interpret, and apply the epistles of Paul is to have a good grasp of the Roman Empire. And always remember that Jesus said the end of the world will be in a time that's like the Roman Empire. So what doctrines did Paul consider vital to teach new believers? Prophecy and sanctification. Eschatology and soteriology. Of course, soteriology first, you need to get saved. But as soon as you get saved, you need to understand, get oriented. Why you're here, your creator, how you got saved, your redeemer, and he's returning. You've got to live for him. Those are the orientations. Those are the dots that Paul connects. Let me just do all the dots for you. There are seven of them, and we're going to go. I'll just run through these. This is the first prophetic dot that Paul connects for us. Christ will be a supernaturally born human that crushes Satan's head as Satan gets him crucified. That's the content of the proto-evangelium. That's what theologians call Genesis 3.15. The second dot is that that coming Christ will come to bless the whole world. He's going to come through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who is renamed Israel. So all of a sudden, Christ is coming, and he is totally connected to Israel, to the Jewish people, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob's descendants. The third dot that Paul connects is the whole world will, get, uh, will seek to get rid of the regathered, reborn nation of Israel. You say, where is that? Well, look at this. He sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. The whole goal of the Antichrist, 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 4, is to get the whole world following him, get Israel to trust him, and then betray Israel and destroy them. Wow. Did you know that's exactly, where did Paul get all that? He got that from Ezekiel 37 to 39 and Zechariah 12 to 14, where God revealed that. And this is what God reveals. If you take Ezekiel and Daniel and Revelation, the Antichrist, he's the nations of the West, the kings of the East, the kings of the North, and the kings of the South all converge on Armageddon on their way to destroy Jerusalem. That's the end of the world. The fourth dot that the Apostle Paul connects, the empire that crucifies Christ will be the final empire ruled by the beast or Antichrist for seven years. You say, where is that? Right there. Daniel 9 and verses 24 to 27. Okay? And basically, Jesus affirmed that. When we get to Matthew 24 in just a second, Jesus said, boom. The only prophet Jesus cites when he talks about the future is Daniel. And he's citing Daniel 9. The most important prophetic verse in the Bible is this verse we're talking about. And Jesus affirms in Matthew 24 the rule of the four empires that Daniel saw, the rise of the Antichrist that Daniel saw, that Paul saw, that John sees and that Jesus affirms is what precipitates the return of the real Christ. Remember, the anti-Christ is not only against Christ, he's in place of Christ. See, in place. He wants to be the Jesus everybody should follow. He doesn't want you to follow the real Jesus. And so, because the Antichrist is deceiving the world, the real Jesus comes. That's the second coming, the arrival of the real Jesus Christ. Okay? The fifth dot is Matthew 24, 15. That's where Jesus quotes. 
what Daniel said and what Paul said. Daniel said that Antiochus IV is the abomination that causes desolation. Now that's what the whole worship of, of the Jewish festival of Hanukkah is about, the desecration of the temple, defiling of the temple by Antiochus, who, by the way, was from here in Athens, and the Philippapu monument that I just took the students to this morning is his grandson, and he built the largest temple, Antiochus did, but he went over to Jerusalem because he was motivated by Satan's desire to destroy God's people, and he defiled the temple, he, he sacrificed a pig on the altar, and killed the priests and everything, horrible stuff. And that's called the abomination of desolation, which Jesus says in Matthew 24, 15, he said that event in the second century B.C. by the ruler of Greece, that event is a presage, it's a preview, it's, it's a, a prefiguring of the final Antichrist that Paul connects the dots with and says, this is the one that the whole Old Testament has over 20 titles for. It's the incarnation of Satan. Just like Jesus is God incarnate, the Antichrist is the one that's indwelt by the evil one and rules the world. Satan finally rules the world that he's always wanted to. Remember he said to Jesus, you know, if you bow down, I'll give you the world. Well, he now gets the whole world to bow down to him as the Antichrist. And Jesus said the Antichrist would be like the Antiochus IV of Daniel 9. He's again described in 11. He's again described in Daniel 12. So Jesus gives us a simple map. And Paul connects all those dots. Jesus gives us the map of the future. It's flawlessly accurate. It's a guide for us to understand history, past, present, and future. When God Almighty, who rules from heaven over the affairs of mankind, gave to Daniel the snapshot of all the ages for mankind, God says, this is all there will be to the end. So when Jesus affirmed the prophet Daniel's description of the four empires and everything that's going to happen from Daniel's time in the 6th century B.C. through the end of the world, that's what the prophet Daniel said. He lived in the 6th century B.C. He predicts everything God's going to do until heaven. And people wondered if it was true. And then what does Jesus say? He said, it's true. See, Jesus, Jesus affirmed Daniel's simple map. And then Paul connects all the dots. Here's dot number six, what I've been talking about all this time. 2 Thessalonians 2, 4. Paul said the Antichrist will defile a literal, rebuilt Jewish temple in Jerusalem. Wow. Jesus said, Jerusalem is God's clock. This is Matthew 24. If, when you do Matthew 24 sometime devotionally, after you're done with Paul's life and letters, maybe you're in our Holy Land class someday and you'll do it. Jerusalem is God's clock counting down the end of the world. This is a summary of what the Bible says about Jerusalem. Jerusalem's mentioned over 800 times, 800 plus times in the Bible. The most mentioned place in the Bible. The close of world history is tied to this little city called Jerusalem. All the world will focus on Jerusalem as the wrath of God is poured out in the tribulation. Fallen his human history culminates with Jesus Christ's descent to the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem as Earth's creator returns to Jerusalem to restore his fallen paradise. That's a summary of prophecy. Wow. And Paul connects all those dots. Here's the last dot. In Revelation 6 to 19, the Apostle John is told 30 years after Paul that a revived Roman Empire that Paul talks about with this Antichrist, this coming ruler that Jesus talked about and Daniel talked about, is led by Satan incarnate, right there, leading the whole world to destroy a regathered nation of Israel at Armageddon. You ever wonder what Armageddon is? Armageddon is the revived Roman Empire with all of Satan's, you know, demons helping, getting the whole world to come to destroy the people of God, the chosen people of promise, the Jews, and that destruction is only stopped by the second coming of Christ. 
Now you say, that's, that's amazing. Yeah. Let me show you the whole thing in 30 seconds. Right now, we are the church on earth, so we're right here, okay? The book of Revelation says that the next event for us is being called up to heaven. We stand before the judgment seat of Christ. While we're in heaven, the tribulation starts on earth. It culminates with the second coming of Jesus Christ to rescue Israel. He sets up his thousand-year rule. Mankind rebels even though Jesus rules a thousand years, and they're, they come before him in the great white throne. And then it's the end of everything as God uncreates the universe, Peter says, and recreates it and makes all things new. And forever, the, those who rejected him, who chose sin, are going to be paying for their sin. And by the way, if you choose to pay for your sin, you'll pay for it forever. There's no second chance and there's no, you know, getting burned your sins off enough that you get a second chance. No, it's eternal destruction in hell or eternal life in heaven. That's what Jesus said. And by the way, he, he talked about that more than he talked about heaven. He warned people not to go to hell more than he invited them to go to heaven. Amazing. But that's, that's a one-minute summary of the book of Revelation. So the land of the book is our classroom, and that's why we're here in Greece. We're right here looking at the Roman Empire that started here, extended all the way there, and we're going to see how Paul's epistles are all tied into this area. Uh, by the way, by 325 AD, look at that Roman Empire. All the pink is where Christianity was, was thriving and flourishing. And look, right here in, in Corinth and Athens, all of this, Paul's ministry, and Asia Minor, the seven churches. Oh, it's just amazing. And we will look at that last part, and I'll be done. The goal of every lesson is for the Holy Spirit to work in our heart. How can the Holy Spirit work in our heart? Well, in Paul's epistles, the 25 systematic theology defined attributes of God, you're going to bump into them as we go through all these epistles. And I'll point them out, now we'll mention it. But let's talk about what God can do as you study his word. Because God wants us to get oriented, remember, why we're here, where we're headed, and all of a sudden it changes how we look at life. What changes? All of our struggles and fears start getting impacted by the truths we find out about our God, his attributes, his character, his being, who he is that we can hold on to. What happens when we hold on to God? Well, let's look at applying the attributes of God, okay? And especially out of the 25, I'm going to take four to conclude, okay? His omnipresence, omniscience, love, and omnipotence. How do we apply these to get our fears and struggles and troubles into his perspective? Like this, okay? That little box is what God puts around my life. His attributes mean I don't go through life unprotected, like out there, anything can hit me. I have a force field, a protective box. I'm in a, a supernatural tank going through life, a safe place, okay, a safe room. And here are the four walls. The first wall is that God's attribute of his goodness is that he always loves me. And because he loves me, he's never going to hurt me. Doesn't mean I'm not going to have pain and trouble. We are, Paul said, you know you're destined for trouble. That persecution comes with salvation. If they hated Jesus, the more we live for him and live like him and look like him, they're going to hate us too. But that doesn't change the goodness and love of God. Okay, number two. God always knows. His omniscience means that he knew about the, the economic downturn we're going through right now. He knew about Russia's threats. He knew about the tactical nuclear weapons. He knew about all that stuff 
before the foundation of the world. Because omniscience means, as we are going to see in the epistles, that God doesn't learn anything. He doesn't discover anything. Nothing surprises God. Okay? He's also not only all-knowing, he's all-powerful. That means, look at this, nothing can get into our box that he doesn't know about and that he doesn't allow. That's why Paul said, I know that all things God is actively working together for good in my life. And he says, look at my stripes I have on my back. Look, I've got broken bones from being stoned. He says, I floated out in, in the Aegean Sea for a, a night and a day in, you know, in a shipwreck. He says, I, I know that all those things are God who loves me and is good and powerful. Could have kept the storm from coming. He, he knew the storm was coming. And he protected me so that nothing accidentally touched me. Anything that touches our life, be it cancer or job loss or loss of spouse or child or friend or ministry or whatever, loss of health, nothing accidentally touches us because God is good and loves us. He's omniscient and knows all things. And he's all powerful, he could keep him from coming. But here's the last one, then we'll go. I like this. God is in the box. It's not that he's out there somewhere running the show. He's dwelt within us because of salvation. He's dwelling within us. We have all of God living within us. Wow. The only problem with life is, you know, when we have Christ, Christ is the fullness of Godhead, uh, and God is, is one God in three persons, and the Spirit of God moves inside and seals us, and Christ dwells in us richly. Do you know what that means? We have all of God. But sanctification, remember soteriology and eschatology? You know what soteriology says? Our lifelong goal is that we have all of God. He doesn't have all of us. And he wants us to be surrendering a little bit more of our life every day. That's what the Lord's Prayer is about. I've mentioned that almost every class. That we say, I want to focus on you, God, and I want you to control me. And I want your will done in my life. And when your will's done in my life, I will see you're supplying everything. You're in the box with me, you know, and you're powerful and you love me and you're with me. And I want you to protect me from the evil one. And I want you to cleanse me so that I don't grieve or quench your spirit. And I want you to empty me so my life is more and more about you. I want to be oriented where I'm headed, who you are, why I'm here. Okay. Three final challenges. Today was a huge lesson. You might want to go back through and take some screenshots. Find someone you can share this with. Especially if they're seeing the newspaper and they're worried about tactical nuclear weapons. Number two, start working on memorizing scripture. Uh, you should, I, I just spoke to a group of people, uh, well actually it's been a couple years now, and I told them they ought to look at all the time they spend on social media and online and everything and take a minute or two here and there and start, start spending about 15 minutes a day. Did you know it takes about 15 minutes a day to start memorizing a verse a week? A verse a week. If that's too much, learn one verse a month. This Navigator packet, that'll keep you for the rest of your life, some of you. Learn one verse every month. I work on my verses every day. This morning, when I started, I started quoting my verses. When I can't sleep at night, and the older you get, you will learn about sleeplessness. I just quote my verses. It's better than counting sheep. Okay, so invest in a plan. And number three, pray for us. Bonnie and I are soon on our way. We're... we're two-thirds of the way through our 10 weeks over here in Europe. We've got a whole new uh, set of classrooms and classes and students. But pray for us because we're equipping frontline missionaries and mobilizing the next generation to reach Asians to reach Asia, Europeans to reach Europe, and Africa to reach Africa. You know what I told my students this morning? I said to them, I said, look at Athens. There are five million people 
in Metro Athens. I said, who's going to reach him? Paul reached Athens in his generation, but who's going to reach this? It's the duty of every generation to reach their generation for Christ. That's what Jack Wurtson, the great youth ministry uh, director of Word of Life said. That should be what we think about all the time. It's the duty of each of us in our generation to reach our generation for Christ. Pray for Bonnie and for me, because we're equipping and challenging and encouraging uh, everywhere we go, people get reoriented to see life, why they're here, to let Paul connect the prophetic dots and to live for what matters forever. I pray that you have a great week as you're chugging through the book of Acts, as you're devotionally studying the scriptures, that you'll add into that some verse memorization and you'll start packing one of those gospel tracts and start reaching your generation for Jesus Christ. God bless you. See you next week.